the U.S. southern border. The U.S. in turn would increase access to temporary visas for Guatemalan farm workers. The president hails it as a win-win. We're sending a clear message to human smugglers and traffickers that your day is over and we're investing in the future of Guatemala. The safety of migrants and their families will protect the rights of those with legitimate claims and will end the widespread abuse of the system. David Spont has the latest from the White House. David. Hi, John. President Trump is at the White House this evening, and he's hoping that this deal with Guatemala is just the beginning of many deals between other Central American countries and the United States. Guatemala has agreed to pay money and allocate more resources to stop migrants from flowing into the United States. The president signed the deal with Guatemala yesterday in the Oval Office. It's considered a safe third agreement, John. It would force migrants traveling through Guatemala to the U.S. to claim asylum in Guatemala. In special cases, folks could seek asylum in the United States. This landmark agreement will put the coyotes and the smugglers out of business. These are bad people. These are very, very bad, sick, deranged people. We'll make a lot of money off other people's miseries. Now, speaking of the southern border, the president taking aim at Congressman Elijah Cummings from Baltimore, a fierce opponent of the president's border policies, no stranger to controversy. The president tweeted early this morning in part, quote, as proven last week during a congressional tour, the border is clean, efficient and well run, just very crowded. Cummings district is a disgusting rat and rodent infested mess. If he spent more time in Baltimore, maybe he could help clean up this very dangerous and filthy place place. Within the last hour or so, the mayor of Baltimore held an impromptu news conference to address the president's tweets. It is completely unacceptable for the president of the United States of America to use his considerable power and global voice to attack a vibrant American city. The president taking a lot of heat on Twitter for the tenor of those tweets. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi tweeted this afternoon, we all reject racist attacks against him and support his steadfast leadership talking about Elijah Cummings. And Jenna Bush Hager, daughter of the 43rd president who lived in this home behind me, told President Trump to knock it off, essentially tweeting, quote, I taught in West Baltimore. I adore my kids, their parents and grandparents. They all want the same thing. I want for my kids the chance for their children to have safe, happy and productive lives. Let's think about the language we use, who it hurts. Jenna Bush Hager, a teacher trying to teach President Trump a lesson. Then President Trump, as he's known to do, doubled down on Twitter tweeting about Elijah Cummings yet again within the last 30 minutes, quote, Elijah Cummings spends all of his time trying to hurt innocent people through, quote, oversight. He does nothing for his very poor, very dangerous and very badly run district. Cummings said on Twitter that it is his moral duty to take care of his constituents. He's chairman of the House Oversight Committee. He's investigating the Mueller hearing, what happened with the Mueller uh, hearings and whatnot. And uh, we'll continue to watch the story, John, but a lot of blowback from President Trump's comments, his tweets early this morning. Back David Spunt there at the White House. David, thank you. President Trump also celebrating a major victory on border wall funding after the Supreme Court ruling that the Trump administration can divert two and a half billion dollars in Pentagon funds for the wall along the U.S.-Mexico line. The president tweets it is a big victory for border security. Garrett Tenney live in Washington with more. Garrett. Well, John, this is a short-term win for the White House because the court didn't rule on the actual merits of the case. However, while the legal process plays out, this 5-4 ruling allows the president to access $2.5 billion from the Pentagon's budget to begin construction on 100 miles of wall along the southern border. After the ruling, President Trump tweeted, wow, big victory on the wall. The United States Supreme Court overturns lower court injunction, allows southern border wall to proceed. A big win for border security and the rule of law. This law lawsuit is one of several the White House is fighting over the president's emergency declaration earlier this year, which he made after Congress refused to fund his signature campaign promise. That declaration allowed the president to tap $6.7 billion from the military and the Treasury Department for his wall. The ACLU, which is challenging the administration in this latest case, is vowing to keep its fight alive, saying, this is not over. We will be asking the federal appeals court to expedite the ongoing appeals proceeding to halt the irreversible 
irreversible and imminent damage from Trump's border wall. Despite the legal battles ahead, former acting ICE director Tom Homan says he has no doubt this additional wall will make the border more secure. If you really look at the data, every place they build a border barrier, it has resulted in a decreased illegal immigration, decreased illegal drug flow. So this is a huge win for the American people. So I think the president's going to move quickly with both DOD and DHS to contract additional miles of, of new border wall in strategic locations across the southwest border. Yeah, there is a lot that can still happen over the next few months. While the ACLU tries to expedite the appeals process, the administration has until September, the end of the fiscal year, to sign contracts for the wall construction. Otherwise, that $2.5 billion goes right back to Congress, who didn't want them to have it in the first place. John? Garrett Tenney in Washington. Thank you, Garrett. Yeah. Former Vice President Joe Biden still leading among Democrats in the 2020 race. The most recent Fox News poll finds 33 percent of Democratic primary voters pick him over the many other candidates. His total is more than double of runner-up Bernie Sanders. Christina Coleman is following this from our West Coast newsroom. Christina. John, a busy weekend for these candidates. From a house party in New Hampshire to a forum full of millennials in Iowa, Democrats are definitely targeting the younger vote ahead of the next debate and talking about the need for more jobs and a better economy. South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who is millennial age, attended the New Leaders Council Millennials Forum in Des Moines this afternoon. The New Leaders Council describes itself as a hub for progressive millennial thought leadership. Mayor Pete hopes he sparked interest in their thoughts. When it comes to address gun violence and more federal funding for public education. Here's what he had to say about his concern over the lack of financial security among millennials. I'm worried that my party is still tempted to deliver a message that basically says we're going to go back to normal. Normal doesn't work, at least the normal that we grew up in. Senator Elizabeth Warren, who saw a bump in the polls after the last debate, had a house party in New Hampshire today. She spoke with Fox News about her strategy for the upcoming debate. I don't think it's enough just to say not Trump. I think we need to come forward and say, here's how we see it, here's what we think is broken, and here's how we plan to fix it. And former HUD Secretary and San Antonio Mayor Julian Castro also touching on the debate at an event in Iowa, recognizing he has some ground to make up. People are basically grouping folks into a top three. So, you know, you may not be their first choice in the beginning. You may be in their top three. Uh, I hope to get into a lot of people's top three candidates and also be the number one, the first choice candidate. I'm asking people to believe in me and my candidacy. And the more that people do that when I show it to them, the stronger we're gonna get in this campaign. So all in all, a very busy day for Democrats crisscrossing the country today in key early voting states of Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. John? Christina Coleman in Los Angeles, thank you. Police once again clashing with protesters in the streets of Hong Kong today. You can see their officers firing tear gas at demonstrators, many of whom used umbrellas as shields. The violence broke out in the same neighborhood where a mob appeared to target protesters less than a week ago. Today's participants sending a message of defiance. We are going to demonstrate what justice is in front of all, in front of uh, Hong Kong people and all to the world. The mass protests began in early June in response to an extradition bill that would have forced suspects to face trial in mainland China. There is growing uncertainty in Puerto Rico after protesters forced the resignation of Governor Ricardo Roseo. The demonstrators now turning their attention to Roseo's expected successor as the chaos prompts FEMA to restrict the island's access to disaster funding. Brian Yenis is reporting from San Juan, Puerto Rico. John, good evening. Governor Ricardo Rosselló may be on his way out on Friday, but the fact of the matter is the allegations of corruption and mismanagement have damaged the trust between the U.S. territory and Washington, D.C. President Trump calling the government here terrible and corrupt. And those who stand to lose the most are Hurricane Maria victims who nearly two years later are still struggling to recover. Take a look at this video. Blue tarps seen all over the island near San Juan and in other areas like here in Naranjito, Puerto Rico, throughout the island. And now 
while FEMA says they are reinstating measures require, requiring the government of Puerto Rico here to provide more documentation and proof before they release rebuilding funds. FEMA says this is an effort to make sure U.S. taxpayer money is being used properly amid allegations of government corruption. Today, we visited the home of Juana Rivera, an 82-year-old diabetic woman who lives in a home with a blue tarp over it. Her son, Jose Manuel Martinez, takes care of her. He says they went months without power, and he blames the Roseo administration for failing to utilize disaster aid funding properly. I feel a little let down because they have money to steal, but to the people that need it, there isn't any. I'm sorry to say, but that's how it is. There should be more oversight and they should take care of the real necessities. There are people that lost barely anything and they got a lot. And those that lost a lot, we've been left with nothing. Meanwhile, already feeling the heat, Puerto Rico's governor in waiting, the Secretary of Justice here, Wanda Vasquez, she's set to take office Friday, but there are calls for her to resign amid allegations that she did not fully investigate the possible diversion of aid supply trucks meant for victims of Hurricane Maria back in 2008. This, as businesses in Old San Juan are starting to get back to normal. Cruise ships are finally coming back, but for some businesses, it's been a tough two weeks of low sales, like at Alfredo's Empanada Shop. It's been up and down. I mean, the cancellation of the cruise ships because of the protests, that definitely affected us. Um, also, the negative publicity of people that might have wanted to come and visit, uh, that kept them away. Uh, in preparation for the, uh, the protests, they would close the street, and uh, that affected the foot traffic. Fact of the matter is, John, there is no certainty who will be leading gov who will be leading the island three weeks from now, four weeks from now. There is a major protest planned on Monday that is set to really just to make sure that Wanda Vasquez resigns before she takes office as interim governor. John? Hard to believe there is still so much chaos after Maria. Brian Yanis. Brian, thank you. Protests breaking out on the streets of Moscow today. Police arresting more than a thousand people there. The demonstrators upset that several opposition candidates are being excluded from this fall's city council ballot. The marchers were on the streets today for about seven hours. A police officer is stabbed to death on the streets of Rome. Now, two American teenagers reportedly have confessed to the killing. The latest on the investigation straight ahead drug deal gone bad. The teens also are being investigated for allegations of attempted extortion. Kitty Logan is in London with more. Two American students have been formally detained in Rome on suspicion of murdering an Italian policeman. It's understood that one of the two Americans is the main suspect in the investigation. That suspect was driven away from a Rome police station following a detention hearing earlier on Saturday. Italian media claims this individual has confessed to the crime, although those reports are not independently verified. A lawyer for this student says his client has refused to answer questions during the hearing. But Italian police say they suspect this student of stabbing an Italian policeman to death in an area of Rome popular with tourists after a drugs deal went wrong. The policeman was reportedly trying to stop the student stealing a bag from a person on the street. A second police officer was also injured in the incident. The suspects were apparently identified on surveillance cameras and a knife was allegedly discovered in their hotel room. Police murders are rare in Italy and the killing has shocked the country. Members of the public laid floral tributes at the scene of the crime. The two American students were due to return to California on Saturday, but they now can be held initially for a period of three days for more questioning. In London, Kitty Logan, Fox News. Police are also working to identify as many as a dozen teenagers captured on surveillance video brutally beating a man outside a Washington, D.C. hotel. It happened last Sunday. Authorities already have arrested one 17-year-old. Investigators believe the attack might have been a case of mistaken identity. Canadian police now going door to door in a small town in Manitoba as they search for two teens suspected of killing three people, including a North Carolina woman. Authorities say they are carrying out the search today, but believe the two are likely long gone. 
Jackie Heinrich is live in our New York City newsroom with the latest on that. Jackie. Well, John, the search is still focused in Gillum, Manitoba, but police fear someone might have inadvertently helped those suspects skip town and warn the teens might have changed their appearances. These are the latest photos from police. The Royal Canadian Air Force arrived today to help with the aerial search, and officers are working to clear several massive abandoned buildings like this one. It has about 600 rooms. For days, search crews have been combing through miles of dense forest and swamps and going door to door in Gillum and Fox Lake Cree Nation questioning people. The fear is the suspects may have paid someone to get a ride out of town. All this, as investigators confirmed to us, someone else did help them when their car got stuck on a trail earlier this week. This is the last known video of Briar Schmigelski and Cam McLeod seen July 21st in Saskatchewan shopping. Earlier that morning, about 100 miles away, a resident in Cold Lake, Alberta, noticed a car stuck on a trail behind their house. They went out to help the drivers get unstuck, and it wasn't until later that night they realized from pictures on social media they helped two suspected killers get away. At the time, the teens were driving the Toyota RAV4. It was later found burned out in Gillum, where the search has been focused for the last few days. The last time the fugitives were spotted was more than four days ago. A source close to the investigation says the teens are skilled survivalists, but have no professional training, and it's possible they went to a bigger area where they could blend in and find food. What police don't have right now is a clear motive for the killings. They were charged with the murder of 64-year-old college professor Leonard Dick, and they're suspected in the murders of a North Carolina woman China Deese and her Australian boyfriend, Lucas Fowler. Police are reportedly investigating Nazi images one of the suspects allegedly shared online, but that source close to the investigation says police are also considering robbery gone wrong. John. What a strange story. Jackie Heinrich, Jackie, thank you. Dramatic new video from U.S. Customs and Border Protection shows the Coast Guard chasing down a boat that officials say was hauling more than 2,000 pounds of cocaine. This happened in the Eastern Pacific. The footage shows the suspects tossing bags into the water before the crew detains them. The Coast Guard says it has seized more than 230,000 pounds of cocaine in the region this fiscal year. A recruitment problem for the men and women in blue. Police departments across the country say they're having a tough time bringing in new officers, with part of the blame going to anti-police groups who create a negative perception of law enforcement. Dan Springer is in Seattle with more. Police in New York were doused by onlookers. The lack of respect was even worse across town where an officer was hit by a bucket as he made an arrest. In a tweet today, Vice President Pence called the conduct disgraceful. Anti-cop sentiment appears on the rise and may be thinning the blue line from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine. According to the Department of Justice, there's been an 11% drop in cops per capita since 1997 and 23,000 fewer sworn officers than 2013. The good economy may be one reason, but increasingly officers point to something else, politics and a lack of support for those who wear the badge. Police officers now are being held to an unreasonable standard and the scrutiny is immense. We are losing good people, and we know that it's because they feel like they're not supported by public officials. A war of words has broken out in Portland, which has 124 officer vacancies. Daryl Turner, the head of the union, says cops are handcuffed by elected officials when policing violent protests involving Antifa and right-wing agitators. Turner wrote, false narratives, knee-jerk political reactions, along with personal and political agendas, have created a hostile work environment. To help recruitment, many departments across the country are easing rules barring facial hair and tattoos. Some are no longer requiring degrees or all the testing. There's also a blue bidding war as departments like Bellevue, Washington are paying a $16,000 hiring bonus for sworn officers who jump cities looking for more support from politicians and the public. It's all about building relationships, and it's all about building relationships with the community. A police reform activist says good officers are getting backed, and the Seattle Department is better off without the cops who don't want the added scrutiny. They did get paid, I, I, and so that's support. I mean, that, that's the big support. The biggest challenge is hiring new officers. Pay is getting better, but this dangerous job is made tougher by America's opioid crisis and mental illness, not to mention the ever-changing political winds. In Seattle, Dan Springer, Fox News. President Trump declaring victory after the Mueller hearings as House Democrats take a big step toward impeachment proceedings. Could their strategy pay off or will it just deepen the divide in the party? We'll discuss next.
to consider, including whether we should uh, recommend articles of impeachment to the House. That is House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler. He and other House Democrats are intensifying calls to impeach President Trump. These efforts coming after Robert Mueller's testimony on the Hill. Mark Meredith explains what comes next. The House has adjourned for the August recess, but before lawmakers left town, the focus was on President Trump and the possibility of an impeachment inquiry. This week's testimony from former special counsel Robert Mueller has left House Democrats split over whether or not now's the time Congress should go forward with impeachment. Since the Mueller hearing, a handful of Democrats have come out to say they're now in favor of an impeachment inquiry. We heard from the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee on Friday. He says Democrats are demanding to see redacted grand jury information tied to the Mueller probe. He says his committee needs all the information it can get if it's to make the best decision moving forward. If our committee is going to recommend articles of impeachment to the House, we must make the strongest possible case both to our colleagues and to the American public. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was asked about the timing of a potential impeachment inquiry, and she addressed the split in her conference over the issue. No, I'm not trying to run out of the pot. So I'm willing to um, take whatever heat there is there to say when, we, when we, the decision will be made in a timely fashion, this isn't endless, and when we have a, a, the best, strongest possible case, and that's not endless either. Presidential advisor Kellyanne Conway spoke to reporters outside the West Wing on Friday. She says when it comes to impeachment, the polls nor the public show much support for the idea. There's no public appetite for that. There may be an appetite among the fringe. There may be an appetite among um, some of the more left wing safe district Democrats up on Capitol Hill. But there's truly no appetite. It didn't look like there was an appetite for that from Bob Mueller himself. House Democrats will have to decide how to move forward when they return to Capitol Hill in September. In Washington, Mark Meredith, Fox News. Mark, thank you. Let's talk about whether the Democrats have a case for impeachment. I'm joined now by Michael Wilner. He's a White House correspondent for McClatchy. There is obviously uh, one wing of the Democratic Party that is eager to impeach the president. But if they didn't get what they needed out of Robert Mueller, it doesn't seem like they're going to have a lot more information coming, are they? Well, I think that's what the grand jury uh, inquiry is really about at the moment. They are seeking uh, more information outside the four corners of the report, as Chairman Nadler said. But of course, if you step back, you always had a wing of the party that wanted to impeach the president, certainly well before uh, the special counsel's findings came out in April. That expanded uh, to about 100 members or 94 members uh, in April with uh, the special counsel's findings. And even though that Wednesday hearing didn't convince all that many additional members of the House Democratic Caucus to join, it didn't dissuade those who believed that uh, the contents of the report um, were a basis for an impeachment inquiry, if not impeachment itself. So you do still have a substantial, if not a majority, of the House Democratic Caucus that wants to proceed, where obviously Mueller's performance notes actually made a difference is those House members who wanted uh, Mueller to make the case, if you will, in a TV moment, uh, he did not deliver on that. Yeah, that, so, right. that, that's my point. I mean, the, the, the right. Democrats thought that Robert Mueller was going to give them, you know, smoking guns and all kinds of evidence, and he really did not deliver that, did he? Right. So I, I think that the public case that they wanted Mueller to make on television was not made. And so at the moment, we're, uh, we're in a situation where Chairman Nadler is indeed looking for an additional uh, evidentiary basis, if you will, uh, to proceed. And I think that that's what this is about. Uh, and he basically put it that way. He said that um, you know, he wants to look outside the four corners of the report because while obviously he is convinced that that provides a technical basis for an impeachment inquiry, he thinks that there's more needed to, to get the country there. So now the House is out on a six-week vacation. It'll be September before they come back and can consider any of this. And it, it seems to me that there's not going to be the appetite in the House and maybe among the American people um, to keep talking about impeachment. Nancy Pelosi has been accused of sort of trying to run out the clock on this. Here's how she responded to that question. We won't proceed when we have what we need to proceed, not one day sooner. 
and everybody has the liberty and the luxury to espouse their own position and to criticize me for trying to go down the path in the most determined, positive way. Again, their advocacy for impeachment only gives me leverage. I have no complaint with what they are doing. It doesn't sound like she's too eager to take up that issue. Right, and of course there's disagreement not only within the caucus over whether or not to proceed at all, but what window they're working with. There are some members who believe that September already is too late. There are others who say that uh, certainly they want to get this, uh, make a decision uh, by uh, Thanksgiving, uh, certainly the Iowa caucuses. Uh, you're talking about uh, making a, a monumental uh, decision uh, for the party uh, that will set the tone of the 2020 race. And she is certainly well aware of that. Uh, of course, we've all seen footage of her talking about uh, the president goading them to impeachment. She is of the belief that this would help the president. So uh, I don't think that uh, what happened on Wednesday has changed her mind on that score. In the meantime, the, the president has been attacking uh, Elijah Cummings, one of the Democratic stalwarts in the House, pretty vociferously on Twitter. What is the thinking behind that? I mean, if he's trying to poke the hornet's nest um, that, that potentially could uh, vote on impeachment, going after Elijah Cummings seems like a strange choice. Sure, and certainly he's, he doesn't discriminate against who he uh, attacks on Twitter. He attacks all of his political enemies on Twitter. But he seems to have acknowledged uh, the racial tinge of, or the racial tone of his attacks on Elijah Cummings with a tweet just moments ago where he did hashtag blacks for Trump 2020. Uh, this comes obviously on the heels of uh, yet another uh, rancorous debate over race in America, over the four Democratic Congresswomen. Uh, so here we are again uh, in a familiar place, and uh, the response from Democrats was quite swift, uh, condemning the president for uh, going after um, Elijah Cummings' district is rat infested and uh, full of rodents. Uh, it's, a, it's a particular attack that uh, a CNN uh, anchor this morning was noting that has only uh, been targeted to uh, African American uh, communities by the president. And so I think that this is going to be yet another uh, difficult debate. Uh, that we have in the coming days. Well, he essentially declared victory after the Mueller hearings, and uh, perhaps the president is feeling that uh, there is no chance for impeachment at this point. We'll see. We'll watch mm -hmm. it. Thanks very Indeed. much, Mark. Mer I'm sorry. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, president Trump scoring two big victories in his border agenda, getting funds for the wall and a new asylum deal with Guatemala as well. But will either of those help solve the crisis at the southern border? Former acting ICE director Tom Homan weighs in. And the criminal aliens that are entering this country. The Supreme Court hands President Trump a victory on the border wall, ruling that the administration can tap about two and a half billion dollars in Pentagon funding to help get it built. As well as a new deal with Guatemala, the agreement would require migrants to cross into the country to apply for protections there rather than in the United States. Here to talk about it, Tom Homan, former acting ICE director and a Fox News contributor. So we've got two elements uh, going on here, the wall funding as well as the Guatemala deal. How big an achievement is this for the administration, Tom? It's a huge achievement. You know, it, it, if the data, all you got to do is look at the data. Every place they built a border barrier in the past, it has resulted in decreased immigration, decreased drug flow. And the asylum, having that agreement with Guatemala is a game changer in itself because people from Honduras and El Salvador would have to claim asylum in the first country they come to. So if they're really escaping fear and persecution from their home government, once they escape that country, they should be eligible to claim asylum in the next country, which would be uh, Guatemala. And what about the, the, um, the two and a half billion that the president now can start spending on the border wall? How quickly would you expect that that will actually start, you know, meaning that shovels go in the ground? I think they have contracts already pending. I think the contracts will start moving now that the money's been freed up. Again, you know, I've read a lot of news accounts in the last 24 hours that call this a president's victory, a president's win. I want to make something clear. 
It's America's win. When we secure the border, there's no downside in securing our southern border. None. There's no downside unless immigration, illegal immigration, no downside unless illegal drugs. The, and the Border Patrol has a strategic plan where the wall needs to go first. As long as they stick to the plan, this will have a, a, a chilling effect on the numbers coming across the border. And will that obviously uh, result in uh, an almost immediate uh, reduction in the number of people who are being held there? That's been the bone of contention for so many um, of the president's opponents lately. Yeah, look, it, it, it's all a big piece of the puzzle, right? The border barrier, the deal of Guatemala, Mexico stepping up, doing more than they've ever done. Look, the president has got an agreement with Guatemala and Mexico now that no other president ever has. This is this is huge. And I, you know, and, and he's, he's declared a national emergency. He sent unprecedented resources. He's doing everything he can to secure the border. It's a sad day in America when the government of Mexico and the government of Guatemala is doing more to secure our border than the Democratic leadership because no one can give me one example of anything they've offered up to address this crisis. And that's what needs to be done. If you want to really solve this across the board, Congress needs to fix the three loopholes that we've been asking them to close for three years. But they have not done it. They chose not to do it. They just want to keep the open borders agenda. They want to talk about rewarding citizenship to people here illegally. They want to support sanctuary cities. They want zero detention. You know, if you, and they want to give medical care to illegal aliens. If you look at the pre, people running for presidential nomination for the president, None of that's going to fix this issue. It's actually going to drive more people to come to this country because these are enticements that's going to drive these people to come to the United States illegally. Yeah, and candidates like Beto O'Rourke have said, you know, take down the wall. Just let's not have any border barrier whatsoever. Well, you know, Beto O'Rourke's proven many times he's not that smart. You know, you, all you got to do is talk to the experts on the border. Has Beto O'Rourke ever talked to a Border Patrol agent who spent years in that line and put his own safety on the line? You know, it, it, these, these men and women leave the safety and security of their home every day to defend this nation. They're standing on that line. Let Beto O'Rourke or Christian Gillibrand or Castro, any of these people, put on a green uniform and a Kevlar vest for 24 hours, stand post on the southern border, the most dangerous part of this country, then come back the next day and tell me you don't think they need a wall. Tell me you don't think this needs to be fixed. Well, talking about fixing it, you said there are three lo loopholes that you would like Congress to fix. What are they? The Florida Settlement Agreement, we should be able to detain families not long enough to see a judge. We did it back in FY14 and 15. 90% lost your case. We sent them home. The border numbers went down. Fix the Florida Settlement Agreement. We need to fix the Trafficking Victims Act where children from Central America are treated the same way as children from Mexico. Once it's determined you're not a victim of trafficking, you can go home immediately rather than waiting for years for a hearing. Uh, the third thing is asylum rules. I mean, 90% of people that come across this border claim asylum. But 90% never get relief from the government. We got to fix that delta. We got to make that first interview mean something so you don't get released into the United States, not to show up in court. And if you show up in court, less than 2% who have been ordered removed have left. So we need to fix the asylum loopholes. You point out that there doesn't seem to be the appetite among Democrats in Congress to fix some of these things. Why? I truly believe it's about resisting this president. The president's number one to the Amer number one promise to American people to secure this border. I don't think the Democrats want to hand him a win, even though it's not the president's win, it's America's win. I think they want to resist this president. They want to make this an issue for 2020. They want to see him fail because they hate this president more than they take the responsibility to protect America and secure our borders and protect our sovereignty. Tom Homan, the former acting director of ICE. Tom, thank you. Thank you, sir. Oregon police and the FBI are asking for the public's help in the search for a missing two-year-old whose parents died in an apparent murder-suicide. His name is Aiden Salcedo. Authorities say his parents were wanted in Oregon on burglary charges. Police tried to pull him over in Montana on Thursday, but by the time officers reached their vehicle, both were dead and Aiden was nowhere to be found. Anyone with information should call the Medford, Oregon Police Department. Authorities are asking that if you're sharing information on social media to please use the hashtag find Aiden. We'll be right back. Las Vegas is experiencing a surge of visitors, but not gamblers. It's grasshoppers. Check out this video. Apparently, hordes of grasshoppers have descended upon the city. Experts say these insects appear after a wet spring. They don't have diseases, nor do they bite, but clearly, they're getting them a lot of attention. 
Crocodiles are breeding in an unlikely environment. They're residing in the cooling canals of a Florida nuclear plant, and wildlife biologists seem to be okay with it. Phil Keating explains. And I'll release them right, and off they go. American crocodiles are crawling back from the brink of extinction and thriving out of all places, South Florida's Turkey Point nuclear power plant. Once in danger, they are now listed as threatened, thanks in large part to the Florida Power and Light crop.